All right, uh, well, it's a little after seven, so we, we can get started. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm David Vermeulen, and I teach here at uh, Nellie B. Chisholm Middle School. Uh, I've been teaching U.S. history there and government for 21 years. Uh, before that, I taught in Grand Rapids Christian Schools in Grand Rapids. Uh, I'm a member here at Ferry Memorial, which, of course, piqued my interest, uh, having moved here and seen the name of the church. Uh, and so it's become kind of a passion of mine to get to know the Ferry uh, family. Um, before we get into the story of um, the William and Amanda Ferry, uh, Roger Sharmer is going to have a few words about the sesquicentennial events. So. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'll be very quick. Um, is Mary Payne here? Okay, Mary Payne is the person who somehow volunteered to head up this whole event thing, and it's been an endless task. And so we had a meeting last night, and one of the things I was supposed to announce tonight is that at the end table, there are these little slips of paper, <clears throat> and on the slips of paper, basically, it's a sesquicentennial celebration cake decorating contest to win great prizes. Um, date of competition is Saturday the 29th, Setup begins at 1 o'clock at the Montague Farmer's Market. Judging will begin at 2. Theme categories, most creative, best use declarations, best sesquicentennial theme. And uh, anyway, it'll all be down at the Farmer's Market. And um, I'm, I'm supposed to encourage you because basically it's kind of a birthday cake kind of situation. So um, there's the cake pitch. And uh, then also there's all the other events. If you picked up a tablet at the end, there's the other events of the sesquicentennial, and, um, and then also there's a, a 150th anniversary uh, thing which I wrote up, uh, kind of telling the story about location, history, and then change, and how it deals with place. And uh, anyway, uh, that's it, and so um, are there members of the, the, Tom and Cheryl, I see you. People who are on the committee raise their hands because there's been one, Tim, yeah, uh, Denise, uh, if I let, a lot, lot, a lot of work and a lot of effort. So uh, let's get on with Dave's talk. Thank you. Well, happy 150th uh, birthday. Um, and I want to thank the committee and the Historical Society for inviting me to share a bit about the history of the Ferry family. Um, of course, Noah Ferry is our favored son, uh, our fallen hero, and considered one of the founding fathers, let's say, of Montague, although he died at the young age of 32. Uh, he played a big impact on uh, this town. Uh, I'm going to move these slides along as I go here. Uh, hopefully this will work out. Um, this uh, image here of Noah is from his eulogy pamphlet at his burial in Grand Haven, um, this pencil drawing. Uh, he was born, Noah Ferry was born in Mackinac Island in 1831. He died on day three of the Battle of Gettysburg at the age of 32. The image is taken from the, uh, the front of the eulogy pamphlet. Uh, it was, the funeral was held at Grand Haven First Presbyterian Church, which his father founded. Um, during his short life, um, he made Montague home. Uh, he contributed greatly to the development of uh, the original community out on the old channel, not named the Mouth or Fairiesville or White Haven or Stump. Uh, all those names you can find on the sign next to uh, Old Channel Inn. Well, that's where the original community uh, grew up. Um, and Noah gave Montague its name. The name Montague is Noah's father's middle name, William Montague Ferry. And so when Noah is involved in establishing this town at this location, he and the Knudsen brothers, who were in business with Noah, actually, and were grocers here, uh, 
they platted a map and agreed to name the town Montague using Noah's father's middle name. Um, to understand Noah Ferry and his influence, you really need to know, need to know his roots. Um, our purpose today is to explore the family, beginning with William Montague Ferry Sr. and his wife, Amanda White Ferry. Um, as you can see here, they had seven children. Um, and to recollect tonight, we hope to recollect their triumphs and, and unfortunately some of the tragedies that the family faced. Uh, the story takes us from Massachusetts to Mackinac Island to Grand Haven to Montague to Shelby to Park City, Utah to Los Angeles. Uh, this family really spread uh, during westward expansion. Um, so, uh, you may want to revisit this slide. I do have handouts of all the slides in the back if you didn't get one, um, because this kind of gives you might need to go back and look at the names a bit. Um, one interesting note about the oldest daughters, uh, Amanda and Hannah, they both were born on Mackinac Island uh, when their parents were missionaries there, William and Amanda. Um, both girls were retrieved by their aunt, aunt Hannah and brought back to Ashfield, Massachusetts, and they were raised by their grandparents. Um, when the grandparents died in 1847, uh, the girls were aged 13 and 19, respectively. Uh, so they traveled to Grand Haven because William and Amanda had moved to Grand Haven at that point, uh, the parents, and were reunited there. Um, we might ask why two girls as toddlers and infants would be withdrawn from their parents to be raised by grandparents. Um, we do know for certain that a Amanda, one of the daughters, uh, suffered tremendous illness on the island. And of course, there weren't many resources for medical care. Um, the other thing that we know for certain is that Amanda White Ferry, the mother, spoke often about the importance of teaching women their sensibilities, and that wouldn't happen on the island. So. She wanted her to have the daughters to have a New England education. Uh, she spoke very fondly in her letters of Emily Dickinson and Mary Lyon as examples of strong uh, womanhood. So he, she wanted her daughters to have that kind of education. So um, this slide is. Uh, a picture of the church, of course, that is attached to where we are meeting today. Um, the building on the left is the manse, the original parsonage, and the church in the middle, of course, Ferry Memorial, named after Noah Ferry, um, and along with a daylight picture on the right. Um, the parsonage and church were donated, the funding for those were donated after Noah's death by Amanda, the mother, who died in 1870. And that money was uh, increased by uh, Noah's younger brother, Edward, to a total of $12,000. Um, the parsonage, uh, the money that Amanda left in her will was designated specifically for the parsonage because there was a Presbyterian church already meeting in Montague at the hardware store, um, and she wanted the pastor to have a home. Um, William had died three years earlier. He left money in his will for a half salary for a pastor there for 25 years. And so he was helping to pay support the pastor of this church. Noah, uh, uh, the, the hardware store burned down, and so suddenly the church no longer had a place to meet and at the same time, Amanda passed away, and they were in the process of building the parsonage. So Edward stepped in and said, let's also provide a place to meet and honor Noah. The father, yes. The father, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the parsonage sat right outside here, but was moved around 1980 to Anderson Road. 
and is now called Amanda's Bequest. It's been turned into a bread and a bed and breakfast by John and is it John and Valerie Hansen, I believe. So, uh, Amanda's Bequest, named after Amanda White Ferry. William Montague Ferry Sr. is pictured here on the left, his tombstone on the right. Uh, the tombstone is in Lake Forest Cemetery. Uh, the four sons are all buried there as well, as well as the, the daughters. Um, you have to walk a good set of stairs to get to the ferry plot at Lake Forest Cemetery. So I'll just warn you, if, if you want to go out and visit, it's a, a bit of a hike up some stairs. Um, William had four sons, and uh, I just want to tell you a brief story about one moment in history, because it, it, to me it captures uh, something of the fascination of this family. On July 4th, 1863, Independence Day, each son was participating in his own way in the War of the Rebellion, the Civil War. The oldest son, uh, William Jr., who was nicknamed Mont, for Montague, uh, was fighting and was injured at the Battle of Vicksburg. This was the day the Union took control of the Mississippi River, so Vicksburg is, is something of a turning point in the Civil War. Um, Thomas White Ferry, the second oldest son, was on the committee to re-elect Abraham Lincoln and was living in Washington, D.C. Um, the youngest son, Edward, was delivering a patriotic oration, according to the newspaper, uh, near the sawmill that the ferries owned on White Lake. Um, and town folk had gathered some using riding the boat. The, the ferries had a, a boat that they took around the lake and picked people up for this 4th of July picnic and uh, celebration. Um, on that same day, July 4th, at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Noah was being buried in a temporary grave near Union headquarters, having been shot and killed a day earlier in the East Wheat Field. So this church is named in honor of Noah Ferry, the fallen hero of Gettysburg. In 1860, before the war began, William Montague Ferry Sr. made a loan to the hardware store to help build that hardware store with the stipulation that the upstairs would be available to the Presbyterian Church. Um, and of course, 10 years later, the, the hardware store burned down, and so then it became necessary to have a new sanctuary for this, this church. Um, William passed away, William Sr. passed away in 1867, and he had already provided for the half salary for 25 years in his will. Amanda, in her will, when she died in 1870, had left $1,500 toward the parsonage, and Edward increased it to $12,000. Um, this original sanctuary was finished in 1874, or started in 1874 and finished in 1877. Um, the church originally was Ferry Presbyterian. In 1923, it was officially renamed Ferry Memorial Presbyterian. And then in 1942, the church was sold uh, to the Reformed Church of America for a total of $1 with the stipulation that the name Ferry Memorial remain permanently attached to the congregation that worships here. Um, the church outgrew that sanctuary in the 1970s, and this particular facility was built in 1980. So uh, let's travel back now a bit. Um, we have a picture here um, of... Uh, the Mission House on Mackinac Island, okay? Um, but to understand how the ferries end up in Mackinac, we have to go back to Massachusetts, where William Montague Ferry Sr. and his wife were born and raised. Uh, William Sr. was born in Gransby, Massachusetts, Granby, Massachusetts in 1796. He was raised in, the New, in New England at the beginning of the Second Great Awakening. 
Um, this was a time of spiritual renewal throughout the country. Indi individuals were being called to repentance toward the forgiveness of sins, but then being told that it wasn't enough to sit and wait for heaven in a better day, but to bring heaven to earth by doing good works. And so out of this second great awakening came an abolition movement, a women's rights movement, a public education movement, a movement to treat people with mental illness with respect, a temperance movement, and a missionary movement um, focused as much as on converting souls as on bringing uh, the American life to Native Americans, uh, both negative and positive in some aspects, if you were to research it. Um, so, William graduated from Union College and New Brunswick Seminary of New York in New Jersey in 1822. Uh, it's an interesting story. Six men graduated from seminary that year in 1822. Uh, they were all interviewed about their placements. They were going, they had, it had been decided they were going to send five of them to what is modern-day Israel, and one to the Native American savages of the Northwest Territory, is how it was worded. The first five all elected Israel, and William was left till last. Um, so he really wasn't given a choice. Um, Amanda's parents were very upset. Um, in fact, William first came to the island by himself to build a house for them. And this is the house, actually. Um, it was much smaller originally, but they added on to make dorms for the Native American children. But that's where William and Amanda lived on Mackinac Island. Um, and, and by the way, uh, the next summer he went back and retrieved his bride, and uh, they came back to the island and they were some of the first passengers on the Erie Canal, which had just opened. Um, so that's part of their story as well. And their luggage got lost, so that was part of the story. <laughs> um, so let's move on here. Um, this is a picture of Amanda, his wife. Um, by the way, there were about 50 children originally in the mission. It grew to 112 students by 1827. These children were primarily what were called Mati, which is French for mixed. They had primarily French fur trading fathers and Native American mothers. The French fathers mostly were practicing Catholics involved in the fur trade. And uh, of course, they were glad to uh, be involved in the fur trade and have a place for their children to stay while they were traveling. So the, the mission was convenient, even though it wasn't Catholic. They were willing to forgo the issue of a religious difference. The Catholic Church on the island wasn't so happy about it. There's records of a lot of conflict between the Protestant and the Catholic churches on the island. If you've been to Mackinac Island, you know those two churches sit side by side, uh, St. Anne's and then the Mission Church which was the church uh, of William Montague Ferry. Um, the Chippewa, primarily Chippewa mothers, were glad to have their children nearby, and so they were satisfied to have their children enrolled in the school as well. Um, you know, uh, William had adopted kind of this Thomas Jefferson vision of America's future, which was the yeoman farmer. We would all be on small plots of land farming and being self-sufficient. So his mandate was to Americanize the Native American children by teaching them, in part, how to read English, how to read the Bible, and how to farm. Uh, that lasted one year. Uh, farming on Mackinac Island didn't go so well, so they gave up on that aspect of the training. Um, but like I said, there were a lot of conflicts between the uh, children, uh, or the, uh, the parents, of uh, Catholic and, and, and the Protestants on the island. Amanda taught in the school for a time, uh, and then they brought additional teachers over from Massachusetts during this time of the Great Awakening. It was funded by the American Board of Foreign Missions. 
Uh, William Montague Ferry had tensions with the missions, that it was being underfunded. He tried to raise funds himself by purchasing a boat and doing some shipping, and then he was ridiculed for that. Um, eventually, after 12 years, he steps away from the mission, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So this is his wife, Amanda. Um, so um, one interesting part of this story is uh, Robert Stewart. That's the Stewart House on Mackinac Island, which you can tour. It's beautiful. Uh, he was quite wealthy in the fur trade. Um, did I miss a slide there? No, okay. And uh, Robert Stewart uh, gave his life to Christ at William's church and was very grateful in that when William decided to leave the mission and the ministry, he gave a $1,000 gift so that he could reestablish himself, but also an extra $8,000 he invested in uh, William's business prospects, which would be lumbering in the Grand Haven area. So Robert Stewart played a big part in his life, and his wife, uh, Amanda, reports in her letters, uh, helped, her, helped Amanda keep her sanity because they, they had breakfast together and enjoyed the newspapers together and talked about what was happening back east. So this is the actual mission church built in 1829, so seven years into the mission, uh, they did get the church built. Uh, the church on the, the photograph on the right is what the church looks like today. Uh, in 1829, I assure you, it was not painted white. It was just wood. So, um, The church went to about 80 congregants, but by 1830, the fur trade was declining, and so the mission started to lose uh, student membership, and the church itself started to fade a bit. Um, Amanda was really pressed into work at this mission, I just should say. She was a teacher and kind of the headmaster of the, of the dorms. Uh, she taught the teacher recruits. Most of the teachers that came out had no experience, so she was kind of their mentor. Um, and in fact, William Jr. writes in one of his memoirs of living on the island that I don't know how my mother kept her sanity except that she was able to retrieve a paper now and then to keep up on the events in the East Coast. So, um, You might be interested in what they, their experience was with Native Americans. Um, Amanda writes briefly in her letters about negative impressions of the conditions in the wigwams. Um, they have not a chair in which to sit. She says the floor is made entirely of dirt. Um, she is horrified by the, gather the annual gathering of fur traders. Uh, she says it's marked by continual drunkenness and frivolities. Um, she also wrote it's impossible to give an, in an adequate idea of their wretchedness. Um, so she could be quite harsh. Um, she actually wrote, I'll just quote here, could you have it in your power to contrast the appearance of the children on the streets with those in my family, you would never withhold your influence, your sustenance and prayers for the civilization and Christianization of these wretched beings. So it was very much a, um, as we look back, um, it's, it's a bit hard as a historian to, to wade through that and and find the positive and negative in, in all of that. So, um, the William and Amanda leave the mission in 1834, and we might ask why. Uh, there were a few reasons I've hinted at here. Uh, he was, his, his health was failing. Some said he had uh, a nervous breakdown of sorts. Um, some wrote exhaustion. Um, Robert Stewart had encouraged him to travel and rest and reconsider the purpose of his life. So there must have been a lot of tensions for him to be writing that. The fur trade was dwindling. The mission was in jeopardy. The foreign mission board was not supporting it with the money that had been expected. 
and there were ongoing tensions with the Catholic Church. Um, for whatever reason, or maybe all those reasons, William and Amanda decide to relocate. In 1834, Ferry traveled to Detroit. From there, he rode horseback to Grand Rapids and then a canoe to Grand Haven. He's looking for a new life for himself. Uh, he hired Native Americans to paddle that canoe for him, of course, and he's searching for where to land and where to go with his family. He already has four children at this point. Um, he has $9,000 seed money, a lot of money in 1834, all from Robert Stewart. Um, from Grand Haven, uh, he hired three Native Americans to canoe him back to Mackinac Island, 240 miles on Lake Michigan. He had decided when he arrived at Grand Haven that is that is where he wanted to be. Now this is where history and good and, and luck can lead to a fortune. Uh, at that moment in history, negotiations were in process to sell all the land north of the Grand River. The tribes were to sell the land or make a treaty to give up all the land uh, to what is now Traverse City from the Grand River North. And William Ferry, before this is even agreed upon, chooses Grand Haven, Michigan, just before the land becomes available for 35 cents an acre. So um, he boarded a ship with 21 passengers, including a, French, a Frenchman, some Native Americans, and his family, and they came back to Grand Haven. And there they went into business with Ricks Robinson and uh, William's brother-in-law, Nathan White. They established the Grand Haven Company. They arrived in November to a 16 by 22 cabin that Ricks Robinson had built. There's the picture of it. It sat pretty close to where Kirby's Grill is in Grand Haven today. If you can imagine that. Uh, they lived in it and the schooner, the boat, through the winter. Uh, and they really struggled with food. You can read about the struggle for food in, the, uh, in her letters. Um, before the schooner had even emptied completely, William insisted that they have church. And they had it in the log cabin. And he preached on Zechariah 4.10. For who hath despised the day of small things? And who knew it would be such a big thing, William Montague Ferry landing on the shore. Um, he establishes a church, and that is the building built two years later, First Presbyterian of Grand Haven, which still exists today and meets in a much grander building than that. Uh, that first church building also served as the town hall and the courthouse and lots of other purposes and the schoolhouse for a time. Um, he served for 20 years, after which the church called its first pastor. He volunteered for 20 years as the pastor. All his sermons were handwritten in cursive, by the way. I laid one out for you to read. It's uh, pretty amazing the depth he went into. This is a stained glass image in the church today. If you go down to Grand Haven, go to First Presbyterian on Fourth Avenue, and... Uh, you can see William Ferry prominently in the, the stained glass. There's also a beautiful stained glass uh, attributed to William Montague Ferry at the Mackinac Mission Church. So, um, I can't get into all the entrepreneurial ex ventures of this family, but um, the, four, the father and the four sons spread north from Grand Haven to Spring Lake to Ferrysburg to Mona Lake to White Lake to Stony Lake. And each of these, of course, involved a sawmill, lumbering, shipping, and then they get into dry goods, uh, grocery, banking. Um, they really did spread their wings uh, quite a bit. Noah and William Jr. established the two mills originally on White, at the mouth and then on White Lake. Um, after Noah's death, Edward gets involved, and by 1883, both mills are called Edward Ferry Mill, and they're both located on White Lake. Um, 
Thomas ran the mill on Stony Lake, and from the records, he ran it into the ground. Um, unfortunately, two brothers, William Sr. and Edward, both report that Thomas had not two cents of business sense. And I wouldn't give two shakes of a straw to have Thomas running anything William Jr. wrote about his brother. So he went into politics. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, so let's take a brief look at each son. We'll start with the oldest son, uh, William Jr., who was nicknamed Mont. Um, he grew up on the island. He spoke uh, Ojibwe, Ottawa, and French fluently. Uh, he was mechanically inclined. He patented a number of mill-related ironworks, and he ran the Ottawa Ironworks. That's another area that the ferries got into. And that was located in Spring Lake. He oversaw the Grand Haven Mill. He guided Noah in establishing the sawmill at the mouth. And in 1854, the, the sawmill at the mouth had been operating for six years. He handed over operations to Noah at that point. Keep in mind, Noah was only 23 years old when he took charge of the mill. Uh, William Montague Ferry was superintendent of Grand Haven Schools. He was on the regency of the board of Uni University of Michigan. He's considered the father of Ferrysburg. Uh, he was a Democrat, and his brothers were not, and it caused a lot of tension. Um, he wrote in one of his letters, I held no, polit no political sympathy with my kith and kin. Uh, in fact, he ran as a Democrat when he moved to Grand Rap Rapids later in life and was mayor of Grand Rapids for two years as a Democrat. Then he moved to Utah and realized he couldn't win as a Democrat, so he formed the anti-Mormon party. That didn't go so well. He ran for governor and lost severely. So um, He's Colonel William Jr. Uh, because he volunteered in 1861 in the Michigan 14th Infantry. Uh, and by the way, he was very critical of Lincoln. He despised the idea of what he called colored troops in the army who were there just to gather food and clothing, he said. So very, very critical of Lincoln. He wanted John C. Fremont to be president by the way. Um, he was wounded at the Battle of Vicksburg, and he was placed as the assistant commissary of subsistence overseeing supply movements in the South during, and West during the war. Uh, he wrote to Washington, D.C. at one point, there are lamentable conditions due to the subtle system that robs the soldiers of sustenance and rations. His general that was in charge of him at that time, Rosecrans, told him, don't you dare innovate without orders. He did it anyway. Created a whole new system of supplying the troops called the commutation of rations, which after the war was adopted as official United States Army policy. Um, and he is still mentioned in military history books as the creator of this system of providing for soldiers. And he left the war with an honorary uh, promotion to colonel. William Ferry, Jr. Uh, like I said, he was mayor. He got into mining in Park City and Utah, um, silver mining, along with his brother, Edward. Um, he lost his eyesight in 1901 and passed away in 1905. The second brother is Thomas, best known as United States Senator from Michigan. Thomas never married. He was featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not as having been president for a day, president of the United States for a day. Um, what actually happened is that President Grant, his term in seven, 1876 ended on a Saturday. Rutherford B. Hayes, the new president, refused to be sworn in on a Sunday for religious reasons, wouldn't take the oath. So Thomas Ferry was the president pro temp of the Senate at that moment in history. There was no official order of secession, but in the minds of most people of the day, the president pro temp would be president if there was no president or vice president for a time period of time. 
So I guess we could say he was president for a day. From all reports, he hid out in a hotel room the entire day and was not seen in public. So. Um, Thomas was often criticized by his brother Edward for mismanaging the family business and his continual absences. Um, of course, a lot of that was due to first getting involved in state government and then national government. So he was, and the re-election of Lincoln. So he was away for quite a bit. Uh, newspapers were critical as well. Um, when Thomas returned to Grand Haven after serving in the United States Senate, he lived a reclusive lifestyle in, with his Aunt Mary. His aunt never married, and, and she, took, she managed the home, and he died there in 1896. The Grand Haven News reported that he died impoverished. The Oceana Times was even less kind, reporting that he died a wreck of a man. Um, Aunt Mary, this is Amanda's sister, um, Amanda White Ferry's sister. She moved to Grand Haven from Massachusetts and taught school in Grand Haven. And there is a Mary White Elementary in Grand Haven schools yet today. Um, she maintained the home of Thomas, the US Senator. That's the home there, unfortunately it burned down. It was a beautiful home in Grand Haven. Uh, after teaching for some time, she became a teacher at Rockford Female Seminary, um, a progressive school advocating higher education for women. And William Montague Ferry, uh, this quite surprised me, in his, in his will left a good sum of money to the Rockford Female Seminary to encourage women to get college education. Uh, we're gonna skip over the third son, Noah, and we'll come back to him in a moment. The youngest son uh, is Edward, and he was involved in managing the lumber mill here in Montague, Ferry and Dowling store, particularly after Noah's departure for the war. He managed the family's money, and he also ran a bank here in Montague. Over time, uh, and by the way, that's his home in Grand Haven, which is privately owned. You can't get in there, but it's, it's gorgeous, obviously. Um, after his father's death, he managed the distribution of the will, $322,000, um, as well as the will of Amanda after her death in 1870. In the late 1870s, he went to Utah with his brother, William, Sen uh, William Jr., or Mont, and they oversaw silver mining and real estate operations. Um, there's varied reports as to the success there. Um, his wife, Clara, was killed tragically in 1888. There's a number of reports of mental instability in Edward over the years, starting in 1883, when business failings cropped up in the newspapers, first with Thomas's name attached, but later Edward's name. Um, and the silver mining apparently was not nearly as successful as Edward often reported and he did some bad land speculating in Utah. And a lot of the fortune was used up. Well, the older sister, Amanda, was not happy, and it went to court. We'll get back to that in a moment. Um, uh, there's a report in one newspaper already in 1877 that he was acting strangely while conducting business. He became delirious on a train, they had to uh, hold him down. He attempted to kill himself, they said. This was all retracted later by the newspaper who said he was suffering from brain fever. But, so it's hard to know what the truth of the matter is. Um, unfortunately, the management of funds by Edward it's hard to get into all the details, but it ended up in the Supreme Court of the United States. So we have a sister as a plaintiff against her brother, Edward. Uh, and Edward's son, Edward Jr., was the attorney in front of the Supreme Court. They lost. 
and they were ordered to pay out $915,000 in settlement. This would be money that should have been taken from William's estate and Amanda's estate and distributed, and it hadn't been properly, according to the Supreme Court, along with the interest of that money. That's where we get this huge number of $900,000. Edward's son was so grief-stricken that the day the decision was read in the Supreme Court, uh, he um, killed himself. And I have the uh, death certificate on the back table back there. Um, so there's quite a tragic end to the fairy family story at, in that sense. Um, I know you can't see this map. I have it on the back tables, but uh, that's White Lake in 1883. And there were two sawmills on the lake at that time, both named E.P. Ferry Sawmill, Edward Ferry. One was the Red Mill, which was located pretty much where Ellenwood condominiums are today, and the other was further up on the lake uh, between Ellenwood and um, the park, Maple Grove Park. You might wonder about the sisters. It's hard to find information on the sisters, unfortunately. Uh, sister uh, Amanda and Hannah, you know, live with the grandparents for a time. Um, sister Mary was Edward's twin. She moved west and ended up in San Francisco. Um, sister Amanda eventually returned to Massachusetts. Um, and married Henry Clay Hall. Um, as you can see there, uh, they, went out, uh, they went out west to San Francisco. Uh, she got involved in training of uh, children, uh, school for the blind. Um, in fact, I have a photograph of that. Mary Eastman, the granddaughter. Um, so, it, like I said, it's hard, unfortunately, there's not a lot of records of the, the daughters. Um, however, her name does come prominent during the lawsuit, of course. So, that brings us to um, Noah Ferry. In all my research, um, this is the only individual image I had found up to, of Noah Ferry up until two months ago. I'll share you that other image in just a moment. Um, he entered the lumbering business in 1854. He was already involved already in 1848 out at the mouth. Um, in 1861, he attempted to volunteer in the infantry like his older brother William and was denied. They said the unit was full. A year later, uh, he encouraged his own men from the sawmill along with others from the White River area to uh, enlist to volunteer, and he was considered the leader of the group and was chosen captain immediately. Uh, Eighty-two men volunteered because, in part because Noah led the way, and 24 hours later they had an additional 20 to fill out Company F of the Ca Michigan Cavalry uh, 5th Regiment, Company F. They get some nicknames, uh, the White River Boys, the White River Guard, the White River Tigers. Those are all different names that are published at different times for these uh, approximately 17 men from Claybanks, Otto Township, um, what is now Montague, that, that area, and Whitehall. Um, this was the sawmill out at the mouth, uh, one of the few images that's available of that. Of course, the channel chain the, the Corps of Engineers dug the channel uh, just shortly after this uh, in the 1860s, and the sawmills all moved to the lake. And um, there's, there's varying reports as to what happened to this mill. Some say, I've read that he sold it to Heald on Maple Grove Beach, and it was reassembled. And others record that it was dissembled and reestablished as the Red Mill at Ellenwood. So I'm not sure which, which of those is true. Uh, this is the Red Mill, um, 1866, and there's the Montague Bridge. Um, and, of course, there's no church in the background yet. So 
So I stumbled across this Civil War collector site about two months ago, and yeah, I was a little excited about that. Uh, this guy in California owns this paint, this photograph of William of Noah Ferry, uh, and his sword. That's his presentation sword. He would not have used that sword in battle, but he was, when he was dressed in full colors, in presentation uniform, he would have carried that sword. The sword was given to him um, by. Grand Haven First Presbyterian Church. Um, and it had a beautiful engraving on it, uh, dedicating it to him for his patriotism. I'll read you the engraving. Presented to Captain Noah Ferry, Company F, 5th Regiment, Michigan Cavalry, as a token of esteem for answering the call to arms in defense of the Union. Put, to put down a causeless and wicked rebellion, honoring our great state with your display for love of freedom and patriotism from your steadfast family and friends in Grand Haven, 1862. So he mustered out in 1862. The unit trained in Detroit for just a short time and then went to Washington, D.C. They were sent pretty quickly to go hunt down Mosby's Rangers, which if you study the Civil War, that name is pretty prominent, a Confederate uh, guerrilla tactics unit in the, in the Virginia area. Um, they were known for quick raids and for eluding the Union pursuers, often blending in with local farmers. Uh, Noah was quickly noticed as an excellent soldier and was promoted to major on December 1, 1862, so only four months in. Um, it was during this time that Noah's commanding officer, Colonel Freeman Norville, ordered his men to walk through an area, to march through an area during a driving rain called Ashby's Gap. The narrow passage between two cliffs could easily be a trap if Confederates were waiting on the other end. Normally, scouts would be sent to ahead to, be, to ensure safety, but the colonel was drunk and gave the orders to march. Uh, soon the colonel passed out and took a bed in a local home. And Noah went to the home and roused the colonel. He ordered all the men to stop, roused the colonel, and told him this, is, this will be tragic, we should turn around. The colonel woke up enough to get on a horse and uh, apparently awakened enough to actually get away from Noah and ride up and order those men to start marching again. At that time, uh, Noah took charge. He disobeyed orders. He tried to get the support of two other men that outranked him to do this, and they refused to give him support, although they didn't decline him either. They just stood silent in a way. And Noah ordered the men to stop and to turn around. And he told everyone, I will take full responsibility. He wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln stating that this is Colonel Freeman Norville. He's our drunk commander. He ordered us into a dangerous situation. I take full responsibility for my actions. Um, our lives were being put in peril by this man. Um, Noah could have been severely disciplined, uh, but he likely saved men's lives that day and was promoted to colonel, actually offered a colonelcy afterwards and declined it, saying that he wished to stay with his men. He feared that if he was promoted, he would be pulled from his cavalry unit. So that's the sword inscription. This was his colonel. Uh, I should say he had served in the Mexican War and. In today's terms, we say he probably had PTSD and was an alcoholic as a result of self-medicating after the Mexican-American War. He was quickly promoted colonel because he had experience, and Lincoln needed experience. Uh, clearly, he wasn't meant for this. Uh, he was discharged after this event. He went home to Detroit. Two months later, he re-enlisted, and he fought at Gettysburg in the infantry, um, even though he had been a colonel previously. So that's kind of an interesting turnaround. Um, in his obituary, uh, they wrote about this colonel, that he has been in poor health 
with nervous disorders for some time. Uh, this image is, was labeled the White River Boys. I can't confirm exactly who was in the picture or if, in fact, it's accurate. Uh, it does appear to be Noah Ferry sitting first row, second from the left. And the man, the tall man on the left, I've been told, is a Mr. Vandenberg. But if anyone, that photograph is on the table if you can identify anybody from what was called the White River Boys photograph. So I want to move ahead to... Uh, the battle. It's May 1863. Noah meets his brother Thomas in Fairfax, Virginia. Thomas is on the Re Republican Re-Election Committee. And they get together for a quick uh, meeting. And Noah hands Thomas a, Thomas a set of letters and says, give these to mom. Give these to Amanda when you get a chance. And then hands him a hymn to be sung in a funeral service and says, should I die? give this to the choir at First Presbyterian to be sung. It's five days before he dies that he did that, May 29. Uh, the, the hymn was titled, Sweet Day, So Calm, So Blue, So Bright. It asked, he asked that it be sung at his funeral, should he fall in battle. July 3rd, the third day of Gettysburg. Confederates were making a frontal assault at Cemetery Ridge, which is not called Pickett's Charge, the most famous battle at Gettysburg. Um, it was a disaster for the Confederacy, but meanwhile, General Lee of the South had ordered a rear assault led by General Chambliss of the Virginia Cavalry. To prevent this rear assault, General George Custer of Michigan ordered his Michigan Cavalry Brigade, that's the Michigan 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Cavalry, including Noah Ferry from the Michigan 5th, to prevent this rear assault in the afternoon of July 3rd. Some of the very first men sent to meet the Virginia troops were the Michigan 1st and 5th, and they took the heaviest casualties. They were forced to dismount because of a large fence in the field. They quickly ran out of ammunition. You know, one of the benefits that the cavalrymen in this unit had is they had the Spencer repeating rifle. The downside of that is that you go through ammunition quite quickly when you have a repeating rifle. And so they ran out of ammunition quite quickly. Uh, one of Ma Major Ferry's men was shot in the arm and fell beside him. Ferry kneeled next to the man who said, I'm hit, I'm dying. Ferry tried to calm the man and assured him that a stretcher would be coming. He stood up and shouted, rally men, rally to the fence. At that moment, Ferry died immediately when a mini ball struck him and went through his head. The Michigan Cavalry and the New Jersey and Pennsylvania Infantry continued the fierce fighting for the rest of the afternoon. The Confederate assault was stopped, and that evening Lee and his men retreated to Virginia and never entered the North again truly heroic day in the, in the course of the war. Um, I placed, um, this is the casualty sheet in, in, uh, stating that Noah Ferry died. It says killed in action July 3rd, 1863. I put in here a letter, uh, Amanda, Noah's older sister, was so distraught, she wrote a later letter to Abraham Lincoln. We don't have that letter. We don't know what she wrote. But her brother Thomas was in Washington, D.C. and handed Lincoln the letter, and he wrote back. And uh, what he wrote is quite, uh, quite stunning. I have the, the letter on the tables back there. Um, I won't read it all to you, but he basically says a lot of what he said in his second inaugural address. He said, he says, if... Um, the blood of 250 years of slavery has to be paid for with an equal amount of blood drawn by the sword. Let it so be. Because the words of 2,000 years ago remain true. The judgments of the Lord are righteous and true. 
So Lincoln actually uses a portion of his second inaugural to address Noah's sister, um, and that's in his penmanship. Uh, Noah died in the East Wheat Field at Gettysburg, and he was buried in a temporary grave near the Rummel Farm, if you've been to Gettysburg. Um, his father traveled by horseback and then train, and then again by horseback to Gettysburg to retrieve the body. Uh, two weeks later, he arrived back in Grand Haven um, and with the body, and a funeral was held at First Presbyterian. Noah's body then is buried at Lake Forest Cemetery next to William Sr. and Amanda, along with Thomas, his brother. The two other brothers are buried there also, but they had families, wives, and children, so they're buried separately in the same area. Um, there is a stone for Noah at Gettysburg, but his body is not there. If you go to the East Wheat Field, it's three miles east of Gettysburg. You have to make the effort to get there, but there's the Michigan Cavalry Monument standing in the middle of a field, and I zoomed in on the... Uh, bronze carving there on the statue. Norval Freeman has two, uh, that was the colonel that had been drunken, right? He has, uh, Colonel Freeman Norval has two stones, one stating his Civil War service and the other his Mexican War service. I found that interesting as well. Uh, this is the battle flag, one of them, for the 5th Cavalry. There's one on display in the state capitol, and this is the regimental flag. There's one of those also on display in our state capitol. The church, of course, was then built in honor of Noah Ferry, and the engraving there you can find on the front of the sanctuary, or the old heritage hall, as we call it, uh, the original church. Noah Ferry, in memory of Major Noah Ferry, who was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg, July 3, 1863. So, uh, what was his contribution? Um, well, Ferry and Son, Noah, William Jr., and Edward, uh, they had two sawmills, a bank, and a warehouse, and a dry goods store, and were involved in the grocery sales here in Montague. Uh, Noah actually helped establish the first school in, at the mouth in 1856, which was later consolidated into Montague schools. He helped plat the first city map in 1857-1858 with the Knudsen brothers. Uh, his brother Edward financed a flour mill, and, uh, which was the building where the Montague Observer was, la was later housed. After the war, William Sr. returns to Montague and to that map with the Knudsen brothers, and they change some of the names of the streets to Civil War generals to honor Northern Union generals. And so William Ferry Sr.'s name appears on the map with the Knudsen brothers. And of course, I'm sure many of you have seen this map from, or this drawing from 1880, uh, where you can see the church prominently displayed in front of the sawmill. I'd like to end with a few letters and writings about Noah Ferry, because they really are quite stunning. This is a letter he wrote to his mother uh, six months before he died. It will be a short time that I will be away. June will bring us all back. If by accident of war I should find my end upon the field, for I will not think it may be in the hospital. You will have the comfort of knowing that I have, by dying in such a cause, not lived in vain, and no un impure motive had a voice in bringing me here. Nor is there in my history anything of which my friends need feel ashamed. Be nice to be able to say that. It's impressive. George Custer, in charge of the Michigan uh, Cavalry. Among the killed, I regret to record the name of brave and chivalric Major Noah H. Ferry of the 5th Michigan Cavalry, who fell while heroically cheering on his men. Colonel Russell Alger, I think from the Michigan 7th, I'm 
if I'm not mistaken. Major Ferry, who was cheering his battalion to hold its ground, was instantly killed. His death cast a deep gloom upon the whole brigade. He was a gallant soldier, an exemplary man, and his loss was a great blow. I won't try to read that to you, but it is in the handout. Uh, he recalls James... He recalls, as a, as a, in this book, Recollections of Cavalrymen, the incident at Ashby's Gap where he, he uh, disobeyed orders. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Litchfield, you have doubtless heard that Noah's brave manhood gave way before the fiends who have so long striven to shroud every northern home in mourning. It was no chance shot that took his life, but the well-directed aim of one of our common enemy. He died as a soldier should die, doing his whole duty fearlessly. All testify to his good soldierly qualities and uniform attention to his duties, fearing nothing, faltering never. Pastor David Cooper of First Presbyterian actually went to the Gettysburg Field Hospital and interviewed men who saw Noah die and used it in his eulogy which I have on the tables. It's 44 pages. Here's some of the quotes from the eulogy. The major was always calm. He went forward up through the wheat field encouraging his men. I saw when the ball hit him, it passed through his head. He was instantly killed. Oh, the regiment could have lost any other man than him. One of the men being interviewed tells the pastor, why don't you recollect how he said to us, boys, if you don't choose to go into this fight, you can stay here. And then he says, not a one of us stayed because it was him. We had to go. He was an officer better loved than any other. The men had a great deal of confidence in him. We always felt that if he took us into a tight place, he could get us out again. He knew just when and where to take us. Lieutenant Trowbridge writing to Edward, Edward, Noah's younger brother, grief-stricken, uh, and by the way, writes at one point, I moved to Utah because I could not return to West Michigan. It's too painful. He writes, Lieutenant Trowbridge writes back, Dear Edward, now my dear sir, although almost a stranger to me, may I not feel that we are drawn into a closer, warmer sympathy by this bad bereavement. You have lost a dear brother, I, a noble, affectionate, and generous friend, our country, a brave, devoted, and self-sacrificing defender. I could not tell you the gloom which his death casts over all of us. We are all most reliably informed by captured officers that the vigorous defense of a single brigade checked and prevented a flank movement of the enemy made by two and a half brigades and had much to do with the glorious success achieved that day. Well, that was the Michigan 1st and 5th Cavalry that prevented the rear assault. Um, I would add that um, the papers available about Noah Ferry are pretty limited that I can find. Um, a lot of this I took from the eulogy along with some other writings about Noah Ferry, but if you happen to know other sources, um, I've scoured the museum and online sources. I've been to the... Uh, University of Michigan has an incredible box called the Ferry Family Papers, um, and, but there's not one letter by Noah Ferry. For example, in the eulogy, uh, Pastor Cooper at First Presbyterian says, I have the letters written by Noah in front of me. I don't know where any of those letters are, but um, so if you ever stumble across that treasure, it'd be nice to, to read the letters he wrote. Uh, that does it, um, and I'd be glad to entertain questions. Jim. Oh, that could be. Did I, I said Vandenberg, didn't I? Yes, thank you. And there wasn't a Vandenberg in the ranks, too, by the way. <laughs> um, in fact, on the roll for the Michigan 5th Company F, there's two, Abram Va uh, two Vandenbergs listed. 
And I think they just duplicated by mistake. Um, yeah. Top, the left, right? Vanderveen, thank you. Other questions? Ben? No, uh, the Civil War collector in California owns it. He bought it at an auction in Utah. My best guess is he bought it out of the estate of Edward Ferry or William Sr. who lived in Utah. He paid $25,000 for the sword and the photograph. And the cost of just ensuring the delivery of that here would have been over $400 just to bring it here. So it's a little, more, little out of my grade, but uh, what a treasure. Yes? Yes, he sure did, yeah. John was the museum director and passed away not too long ago, right? Uh, at Vicksburg, I believe he was visiting the Vicksburg uh, Park, yeah. Steve, I didn't know. Uh, Jim, would you like to tell the story about the Dominican family? Well, <laughs> Knutson. All right, there was the two Knutson brothers, Evan and Anders. They were not twins. There was a year or two difference in their ages. And my ancestor was uh, Hiram E. Staples, my great grandfather. He's the Staples of the Staples and Coville Lumber Company. Um, Hiram, as I remember, had two sisters. I believe one's name was Jesse, forget the other name. But apparently, these two sisters married the two Knudsen boys. Uh, one sister, I think it was Jessie, and her husband wound up in Texas. And he was a buyer of cattle for the Eastern markets. And there was, of course, a lot of Texas meat going, going east to the uh, New York and Pennsylvania. Now, this was in, I think, the 1904 to 1908 era. So it's a little after uh, Professor Anderson's discussion era. And uh, when I finish, if he wants to correct the dates, I'd be welcome, I'd like to have him do it. But the point was that uh, even uh, when he was out in his rounds calling on various cattle ranches in his undoubtedly Model T, Model 1907, he always carried a loaded pistol because in that territory, in that day, you ran across some kind of rough characters and uh, you wanted to let them know that you're, you're loaded and ready for them. So one day he went on his rounds and he came back to his home. Not sure what city, but he came back to his home and he took off his duster and the dusters are what the fellows wore, that the long coat almost down to their shoes. And he handed it to his wife the duster had a loaded pistol in it. She shook it out. The pistol discharged and killed her instantly. And of course, disaster. Well, th after that, as a story in my family goes, he wrote um, Jesse's brother, my great-grandfather Hiram Staples, and said, I have two young daughters which I cannot raise out here by myself in Texas. Would you help? Yes send them to me. So the two daughters came to Whitehall, uh, moved in with a family at 222 Mears Avenue, the yellow house next to the playhouse. They were raised by my great grandfather and great grandmother like their own children. And they were both married from that house. Uh, one's married name I think was Monroe and I forgot the other one. And they went their paths, but their formative years were spent there at 222 Mears Avenue because of the untimely death of their mother. If I've mistaken the generations, let me know. <laughs> okay. But then, then they married into the Pitkin family. 
One of them married into the Pitkin family, and Raj, I wish I knew the connection better than that. Uh, Terry, you know anything? Uh, Ruth. Ruth, would you know any connection there? I the one of the that was the Anna. Anna. Oh, oh, married into the Pitkin family. Anna, the older of the two girls, married into the Pitkin family. Oh, she married Clarence Grant Pitkin, who I assume was your stepfather-in-law. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry. Thanks. I did want to add, uh, Noah Ferry's name appears on the um, deed to the home right around the corner from the church here with the date of 1859. So it appears, uh, prior to that, all the records show him living in the boarding houses with the men. Uh, but he bought a home um, just next to the church here. Um, and so it appears he had planned to settle down here uh, and then, of course, went off to war shortly after that. He also owned the building, his name's on the building, having purchased it from Nathan Sargent in 1859, uh, the building um, where the tea shop was previously on the main street here. So interesting to find his name on these different places, but particularly the house. They somehow come to here, they end up in Michigan, and then he ends up in Texas. And you can imagine, I mean, there were no jet planes, all right? It, it's, it's amazing how they got around. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Mary died in 1876. I gave you the actual article. I'm sorry. Tell them tell that Mary okay. was the same. Okay. Uh, Mary died in 1876, he was saying, the year 1876. Honors. Okay. And oh, oh, okay. In November of 1863, Joseph Fields, Simon Murphy, and Jonathan Eddy bought the mill from Morty Ferry. Okay. And then they ran it, Joseph Fields and Simon Murphy, for At that location? At the location. Okay, because there's a couple of records of it being dismantled. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. All right. So the healed mill was at Maple Grove, and eventually the mill at the mouth ended up there then, but the healds ran it for quite some time out at the mouth? Okay. Okay. Oh, really? Wow. All right. Well, thank you, and uh, if you have questions, I'll be by the tables in the back.